The Unshackled Waves, episode 223. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Another state election is due in Australia in less than two weeks before the expected federal election in May this year. The voters in New South Wales go to the polls on Saturday, March 23rd, and pollsters and political commentators are predicting it to be one of the closest elections in living memory. The Liberal National Coalition has been in power for eight years, but is now on its third premier during that time, with Gladys Berejiklian facing her first electoral test. Labor is now on its third opposition leader, with Michael Daly having only been in the job for four months, but could still very well be the next premier. How does a state that has the strongest growth, lowest unemployment, budget surplus and infrastructure projects going on think of changing government and returning to a party when it was last in office was inept and corrupt? That is what I am aiming to ascertain today with my guest, New South Welshman and contributor to Pop and Lock, Daniel Gibbons. Daniel, welcome to your first appearance on the Unshackled Waves. Thank you. No, great to be on. Now, you'll be voting in the, the New South Wales state election, so you're the one that's going to have to make an informed uh, choice about who you think is best to govern New South Wales or which party uh, you believe is the, the best to make a, make a difference. But obviously, to, to be informed, or well, you'd hope, you need to know about the, the issues. And I thought we'd begin this election preview by uh, looking at the past eight years of the Liberal National Coalition government. Now, the Liberals uh, came to power after 16 years of Labor rule in 2011, they promised to, to build big on infrastructure after years of uh, Labor neglect and also end the, the corruption that uh, plagued the, uh, the Labor government. So there was a real sense back in 2011 of renewal and that the, the state would mend. This is what they always promise these things. They say that they're going to get all this kind of stuff done, but whether they do it or not is a different question. Now, I live in the northwest area, so in the hills, that's like Bowman Hills, Borkham Hills, Kellyville. It's where um, Alex Hawke's seat is. People might know him. He's a federal member, but um, but basically we, they've been building a, um, a, a big infrastructure project around that area, um, which is supposed to be going up, I think, in May. So... That will be, um, I think, a big thing in this local area for voting for the Liberals because finally we get a train um, to actually go somewhere. But we mostly vote Liberal anyway. So when we have that one infrastructure project that's going well in an area that usually votes Liberal anyway, um, strategically thinking, we'll have to see how it turns out elsewhere where the projects aren't going 100%. <laughs> Well, it's been talked up, this government, as one that, that gets things done. And there's been taught that the budget's in surplus, unemployment is low, uh, it's the fastest growing state. Uh, but for all this talk of in infrastructure, it's been pointed out to a lot of people, and you just alluded to you there with the promised infrastructure, that things are being built, but they're not actually being finished. Sydney is just a con construction zone. Yeah, I mean... Um... This is the thing, like you have that, uh, that that tram in the in the city that's been worked on for centuries, the light rail. And um, I think like one though, one thing I do know is that absolutely the, the I'm pretty satisfied with the delivery of the local um, infrastructure here in the hills. Um, they're, uh, they're, they're going to be delivering that really soon. So um, and they've been on time with that. I think they're actually ahead of time and under budget, which is impressive for government. But um but the light rail has been, it's, it's kind of a funny little thing because, I mean, we used to have light rail and they tore it up and now they're putting it back in again. Um, it's kind of a big mix. And uh, there's also always constant works on all sorts of different things. And people look at it like, I, I talk to friends and like, it seems like they just ripped up the road and put it back together again and nothing's changed. Like it's, it seems like a big kind of push for GDP growth where growth isn't just to try and push up numbers, even though there's actually no real um, construction or productivity being done. Yeah, it sounds like a Keynesian exercise, rip the yeah. rail uh, up uh, to create jobs and then put it back in to create more jobs. But they've 
the light rail on George Street, they've destroyed a lot of small businesses there just because it is a, a construction zone and there's a, well, there's been a class action by the small business owners and there's also been a, a lawsuit uh, by the uh, contracted builder as some Spanish company. So it's been pretty a uh, disaster. Well, this is it. Like, what frustrates me as well is that when they always talk about getting jobs and all sorts of stuff, it's not that they get jobs for Australians, they get jobs for foreign companies that come in. Of course, you know, Keynesian perspective it increases GDP growth, it's fantastic. But when you actually look at the reality, um, it, it's, it's not actually supplying Australians with extra growth or extra kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, GDP growth in the sense that people are getting it. We've already seen that there's a per capita recession. When we look at it like from that perspective, the, the kind of fast around how now we're getting sued by a, a foreign company because we've failed to deliver on what we've, you know, said in the contract. And then also Liberal Party being the, 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 the party of small business, just basically ruining small businesses in the local area. It really kind of makes you think, well, what is the Liberal Party doing with this kind of stuff? Like, of course, any kind of construction and stuff like that's going to have issues about how, uh, you know, how people are going to access business is going to try and it's always going to be a problem. But when they fail to even really think about that, when they basically completely neglected it and have allowed businesses to fall under and to, to, to you know, weaken under this kind of thing, it shows the Liberal Party didn't really, either they didn't care or they just didn't think it through. Uh, I contrast it with the Victorian Andrews government for all its flaws. Uh, it's managed to get infrastructure projects done. Uh, its signature policy was the level crossing removal and they were pretty politically genius how they did it. They started it when they got into office removing the level crossings and made sure that it was all completed by the time the 2018 election uh, came along and so voters were able to, to see election time. Wow, look at all this stuff that's been done. I'm going to vote for another four years of that, which was genius. Exactly. I mean, this is the silly thing as well is that, I mean, uh, I guess the light rail thing over here in the hills, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was planned underneath Labor, I believe, but it wasn't actually fulfilled. Now, people get to see, you know, the, when they're driving around, they get to see the stuff being constructed, but it, it, it's, it, it's a world of a difference when you're actually utilising it and using it and then uh, associating that with like, oh, well, this was the government that built that, I'm going to vote for them again. And... Um, when people aren't following the news that much, they might think that the construction has been going on for ages and they don't know when it's going to be finished um, and all that kind of stuff. I think that um, the, 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 the party is being very much trying to push this whole thing about statistics. They've been trying to really push that, you know, the statistics are on our side, GDP growth is up, unemployment is down, um, wage growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I, I just remember looking at Dominic Perrottet's Facebook page and he was sharing all sorts of graphs, which, funnily enough, if you actually read the little small print at the bottom, it says that they're all projections. They're not actually uh, what has been delivered yet. But, um, but you know, it's, it's it, they're really trying to push that because I think they know that they don't have a tangible, real thing that they can say, look, this has been done, it's finished, now everyone's using it. They don't have that yet. So they have to push the st uh, statistics rather than just letting it go. Now, one of the political theatres you have in New South Wales is the Independent Commission Against Corruption, which has these uh, hearings, open hearings into alleged corruption by not just politicians, by uh, associated uh, people in government bodies, and it's even investigated business uh, people. Now, in the first term of the uh, Liberal government, it costs eight Liberal MPs their, their jobs because for some, it's a stupid ban, in my opinion, ban on uh, donations from property developers. And it also cost uh, the first uh, Liberal Premier, Barry O'Farrell, his, his job when he, he couldn't remember that he received a $3,000 bottle of Grange as a gift. And he misled ICAC. And then afterwards, it came out that he'd actually wrote a thank you note to the, the donor, which it was a pretty... Uh, terrible i think gotcha exercise but uh, that was that that was the end of barry o'farrell and then they went after margaret canine who's a well-known crown prosecutor uh, over an accident involving uh, her son's uh, girlfriend and that uh, case went to the high court and it was found that icac 
exceeded its uh, power and ICAC is criticized for being a, a star chamber and uh, for all its effort going after uh, corrupt former Labor ministers Eddie Obeid and Ian MacDonald. Ian MacDonald's had his uh, conviction overturned and he's free from jail on the, the eve of the election. I, I personally wish that like, you know, we, we, it's kind of like a double standard, right? Where we have this idea where we can try and stop people from donating when they're property developers, but we don't stop them in literally any other circumstance. We have massive donations from banks. We've got massive donations from foreign companies, foreign, massive donations from all sorts of corporations. This is literally um, in the Australian Electoral Commission disclosures. Like, they have to disclose this stuff. When we have that kind of double standard where, oh, these people can't do it, property developers locally, they can't do it, but oh, we're going to accept the million dollar donations from all these other companies. It's to me like it's 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 just ridiculous. I think it's like it's a it's a little bit of a show. It's a bit of a feed to people who are skeptical of politics saying, oh, look, yeah, we do care about corruption. Here you go. He's, he's a little, you know, we can't accept donations from property developers anymore. But don't don't look at everyone else that we're accepting donations from. We, we you know, don't worry about that. Um, if we were indicting everyone over donations, then we should be indicting almost every politician, if not every politician, because all of them have received significant donations from corporations and companies. Um, and I think it's ridiculous, really. Like, I'm, I'm against it completely. I think that um, it's, 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 it, it, they end up directing policy and it's, it's dangerous. But as I said, it is a double standard. I think property developers are probably one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the least least of my concerns when it comes to corporate donations. So after Barry O'Farrell resigned as Premier, Mike Baird became Premier. He won the, the 2015 state election convincingly. They had a reduced a majority, the, the Liberals and Nationals, but he was quite popular. And then in response to a Four Corners uh, program, he decided to ban greyhound racing throughout the strait and the uh, their coalition partner the the nationals the the rural party where the uh, a lot of uh, greyhound industry is is based uh they went uh, along with it and there was huge backlash in the bush and in the mm. conservative media and eventually uh, mike baird had to uh back down on that but it was seen as his downfall and uh, the second uh, liberal premier bit the dust yeah, I mean, this is the thing about politics is that if you're going to go out and do something that's radical and outrageous, that's completely contrary to what your party is supposed to be about, which is just, you know, kind of hands off governance, um, then you should stick to it. Then he should have stuck to it because ultimately um, it's been his downfall. If he really wanted to keep going with that kind of direction, then you only damn yourself by trying to pull back because then it's like an admission of like, oh, I did something wrong. And um, ultimately, no surprise. But well, he's pretty happy right now. Now he's, you know, I think he's the head of communications for NAB or something along those lines. He's, you know, he's, he hasn't lost anything. So whatever. <laughs> Well, the consequences for the National Party was they lost the, the orange yeah. by-election in 2016 to the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, who have really uh, made sure they've got a huge presence out in the bush and getting it for a, a minor micro party to get a lower house MP, that's a pretty significant uh, achievement. And of course, mm. there was the Wagga Wagga by-election in, in 2018. Uh, that was won by an independent, but that's because the, the previous uh, Liberal MP resigned because uh, of a corruption uh, allegation. But of course, by-election losses in your heartland, they're not good at all. And uh, the Orange by-election, that saw the, the downfall of the second Nationals leader and Deputy Premier, uh, Troy Grant, uh, Andrew Stoner, he resigned of his own accord. He wanted to retire. And so uh, Nationals are now on their, on their third leader. So the uh, revolving door of Premier that was introduced in the dying days of the Labor government is still present in all the parties. Mm. Yeah, well, exactly. And I mean, I think this is just the kind of new norm, it seems, with... Um, with, with parties like you have um you go back to bilky peterson i think he was premier for centuries so <laughs> i think he's been premier since the 1700s but then you know now it's coming to everyone's premier for about five minutes and then they get kicked out i think um it's 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 disappointing because it, it makes you question or maybe maybe it's a good thing in a way we can see how 
irrelevant they almost are. Um, the Premier seems to be at the head of this kind of, you know, the, the government on decision making and stuff like that. But the fact that the parties feel like it's so negligible, their role, that they can just keep switching them out when they need to, it's either one, the parties are fundamentally broken and they're just doing politicking, or two, the role is useless. Um, I think that's a question people have to consider. I think it's probably more the politicking, um, but it, it kind of shows the dysfunction of everything currently at the moment, and it also represents why the uh, the, the primary votes of both Labor and Liberal are so uh, down, because people are losing confidence in the major parties. They're not feeling like they are responsible and they're holding to what they say they're going to do. Going back to the Greyhound ban, that's probably the, the signature standout sign that this has been a really left-wing uh, Liberal National uh, Conservative government. And I'll mention other issues. They're sort of flip-flopping on, on climate change. Their state energy minister has been critical of the, the Morrison government for wanting to, to underwrite coal and not uh, favouring renewable energy. Uh, Gladys Berejiklian herself has sort of flip-flopped on immigration, saying, oh, we, we sort of need a a big Australia of it, then we don't need it. And then they've done both parties because the, the New South Wales nationals, they're, they're pretty left wing, especially their, their youth uh, wing. They've, uh, they've spearheaded both parties, uh, ha hate speech laws in New South Wales, which now make it illegal to uh, incite violence on the basis of a whole bunch of attributes. There's yeah. the uh, exclusion zones around uh, abortion clinics and a lot of people have been saying what is the point in having a so-called conservative government if that's what, uh, how they're going to act. Exactly. I mean, that's it. The, the problem ultimately is, um, you know, you have all of these uh, core issues that are things that the people who usually vote for these parties really care about. Um, they, they're not protecting abortion, um, uh, the, the right to protest abortion. Um, and they're not really, um, you know, keeping, which is a freedom of speech thing, right? And, and, they, and they've shown like the hate speech law stuff as well. That was just ridiculous. Like it, I looked at the legislation, it was just insane. It was like, I can't remember the top of my head what it was. Um, I encourage anyone to read it though, because if you look at it, it, it is so broad and so ridiculous. Um, and then also, yeah, it, it's, it's just a constant showing where these governments that we're electing is not actually, uh, you know, they're not representing what they are saying they're supposed to be representing. Um, and they're on top of that, more reflecting the kind of um, trend that we're seeing almost like globally, at least in Western countries, where we have these traditionally conservative parties moving further to the left and starting to push more progressive agendas. Um, and they're not interested in what their base is interested in at all, um, which I, I'm hoping we'll see um, as a result of that, an upsurge in minor parties who more represent their base. Now, Gladys Berejiklian, and everyone just calls her Gladys for short, not because we're disrespecting a woman, but because her last name is hard to pronounce for a lot of people, so we just refer to her as Gladys. Now, she is, of course, the first uh, liberal premier of any state, uh, but uh, she hasn't won a mandate from the people, and the only state in Australia where a female leader has won a mandate is Queensland with Anna Bly and Anastasia Palaszczuk. In fact, now Queensland has a female premier and female opposition leader. And so the, the woman factor, especially in this uh, age of you know, the Liberal Party needs to have more women, it's, it's sort of seen as a, a test of do the voters like female leaders? And of course, there's been the uh, the liberal hacks have all, all been attacking the uh, music festival people because they called uh, Gladys Berejiklian the the wicked witch of the fest or this terrible misogyny of the the left wing. They're they're trying to play the the woman card here, saying oh, you're yeah. victimizing Gladys because she's a woman, which is I find just so pathetic. Like it's just. You, you, you can't win the cultural war if you're going to start using their attacks against, against them. They, that means they've won. That means they have 
successfully taken over you and now you are part of the problem and um you know now now they're trying to you know i, I called it out on my own facebook page saying that you know i, I don't remember who it was was it Oh, I don't remember the MP, but there was an MP that was, you know, that that posted this, pointing it out, saying, oh, you know, the the Labor Party's being sexist and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. And it's like, come on, like, are you conservative or not? And and he even said it in his post. He like, goes, oh, I'm a bit of a conservative, but you know, this is sexism essentially. Um, it, it's that kind of stuff where it, it doesn't. I don't think it meshes well with the base of the Liberal Party. I don't think they care. I don't think they've ever cared. I remember distinctly when um, Julia Gillard, when she was um, Prime Minister, everyone was talking about her being the first, you know, female Prime Minister. And then a lot of the base on the Liberal side literally constantly hammered that they don't care. They do not care. Um, I, I talked to, you know, uh, like, uh, women who would vote for the Liberal Party and they would say, who cares? You know, they hate it when women say, oh, they're voting for Julia because, you know, she's a woman. And, and I think that when you're trying to move towards um, the Liberal Party being all about women in the party and stuff like that, sure, whatever, women in the party, fantastic. Whether they want to be in the party or not is a different question. If they want to be, great. But pushing it so far that it starts to become a big issue is probably going to not um, mesh well with the base. I think it's fair to say that Gladys is not a good salesperson. Like, she doesn't speak with much authority. She seems very uncertain. And so when she's trying to promote these infrastructure things, she, she doesn't, she doesn't come across as, as authoritative. And I think that's not a, a woman uh, thing. That's just her. I mean, you know, Margaret Thatcher could speak with uh, more authority than, than any man, but it just seems that glad she, ha and it's, it's seeped into, because I see the, the ads on Sky News for the, the Liberal Party for this election, and the ads are too, they're, they're too positive. Like, there's there's not enough attack on Labour. I've seen a few Labour attack ads, and uh, they're, I mean, Liberal attack ads on Labour, and they're, they're pretty mild. Like, I think Liberal attack ads have always been pretty poor. What they've always relied on is um, media to really do the attack. Um, I can't recall a time in my life anyway that Liberal Party really got it. I think even Tony Abbott kind of just rode a a wave of anger towards Labor rather than a love for Liberal. And um, when it kind of showed as soon as he got in, he became very unpopular. Um, and ultimately, it kind of relies on media. I think that the Liberal Party is um, in, a, in a kind of crisis in that it's not really sure what its identity is. It's not really sure what it's supposed to be doing. Um, Gladys reflects that kind of crisis by embodying that kind of uncertainty and almost indifference because she doesn't know what she's supposed to be, essentially. She's just trying to push for this kind of administrator sense. And I feel like that's what I would call the Malcolm Turnbull government and then the governments that have been underneath him, which, you know, the state governments and stuff like that, have moved towards being not a party that's based upon ideals and values, but a party that just wants to administrate. They're just there to just administrate and try to be as effective, as efficient as possible. Um, and when it comes to cultural issues, they're not going to fight them. They just want to restrain them. And I think that is going to have a really big problem when it comes to getting votes because people are very emotional. It's just natural. People are emotional people and they, and they want to be able to grasp onto something that's real. And um, all they have at the moment is statistics, and even that, um, I, I think, is a bit of a farce. Now, another infrastructure disaster, well, it's more a PR disaster at the moment, is the, the stadium's rebuild. Now, uh, there's uh, been a push, and the, the state government has uh, run with that, to knock down and rebuild uh, Sydney's two main sporting arenas, mainly used for, for rugby. Uh, the Sydney Football Stadium, known as commercially as Allianz Stadium, in Moore Park in, in Sydney's East, and uh, Stadium Australia, or ANZ Stadium, at uh, down in Homebush in the, the Inner West, which is where the, the was the Sydney Olympic Stadium. Now, the Sydney Football Stadium opened in 1988. It's over 30 years old. I've been to that stadium and I thought it was a pretty crappy stadium. So I can understand the the, the need to rebuild that. Uh, but the Sydney 
Olympic Stadium was opened in 1999. I mean, it's only 20 years old. The fact that you knock down and rebuild that, and that fits 80,000 people at the moment. The proposed new stadium was only going to fit 75,000. The apparent need to rebuild that was to make it a proper rectangular one rather than an Olympic one. But And this was going to cost $2 billion in total. And, of course, the, the argument from, from Labor has been you're spending money to knock down and rebuild these two perfectly good recently built stadiums and you're not going to fund schools and, and hospitals. I guess it's like, you know, it comes back to the, you know, classic Keynesian, we just get to boost GDP now because we get to knock something over and uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. It's, it's, it's definitely, I think, to push the economy further. Um, I think that they see that there's an issue with their construction economy, um, with the housing um, boom completely declining now, it's going into a housing decline. They, they can't rely upon construction to keep the growth going, which is what New South Wales has been relying upon heavily. Um, so they're seeing that as an opportunity to splurge some cash to push up the GDP, and I think they're pretty upset that there's, there's opposition to that. Now, I think... Um, I'm, I'm not. Well, I really don't have an opinion really on whether it should be rebuilt or not. Um, I think that you know the the, the Allianz Stadium is is pretty old. It doesn't look very attractive. If they could build something that looks better, fantastic. I think the Labor argument that it's going uh, that 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 money is no longer going towards schools and stuff like that is kind of ridiculous. Um, I think that you know. Like a lot of these projects need to be built and done sometimes, and if there's you know official um, people who think that it should be done, then whatever, just trust the officials, I suppose, or the, the not the officials, the experts, as they call them. But um, but you know, because there's there's plenty of school funding, there's plenty of um, funding on hospitals and stuff like that. Um, I think the labour argument's poor. I think a better argument would be just that you're doing it just to push GDP growth. But labour can't make that argument because they do the same thing. Now, Gladys, in the end, she decided to just go for a refurb of Stadium Australia, which is to uh, knock down and rebuild just the two ends and keep the sidelines of the, the, the main stadium. Uh, so keeping that Sydney Olympic Stadium relatively intact, which I think was the, the right call. Uh, now... Sydney Football Stadium is being knocked down in the middle of the, the state election, which is why it's in the front of everyone's mind and uh, pro probably why the Labour and the left are opposing it even more is because Alan Jones is on the board of their SCG Trust, which manages the uh, Sydney Football Stadium. And so Alan Jones, he's he said that... Uh, Sydney Football Stadium, it's unsafe. Uh, it was built before the, the Hillsborough disaster in 1989. There wouldn't be enough space for people to get out in an, an emergency. But because Alan Jones is so reviled from the left, uh, the left is like, well, if Alan Jones is in favour of this project, then uh, I'm, I'm going to be opposed to it. And the new uh, Labor leader Michael Daly said on Alan Jones's radio program, "If I'm elected, I'm going to sack the the SCG Trust board, including including you, which uh, which was a great meat for the for the left, and that's obviously helped his uh, campaign. That you know he stood up to this the bully boy Jones. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's like it's it's turning into a kind of. Um political tension zone that they've just created. It's like it's like they needed an issue. They don't really... I don't think Labor knows what they really want to do either. I mean, they, they're, they're not very... Um, I, I, I cannot recall on the top of my head anything that they really said that they're going to do besides free TAFE and um, infrastructure, which is a very generic, like, yeah, we're going to build infrastructure. Fantastic. Um, you know, it, I think they're just trying to create, like, a, a political flashpoint where they can really try and draw attention. Um, and when they have little situations like that that come up with, um, he's saying he's going to fire Alan Jones on his own radio, um, you know, that kind of thing is a, it's great for coverage. The left don't like Alan Jones for obvious reasons. So, um, you know, that, that kind of thing is fantastic for them. But I think um, if anyone wanted to actually look at the rea reality of what they're trying to promise, they're really not promising much other than just infrastructure and free TAFE. <laughs>
Now, I mentioned the, the Labour leader, Michael Daly, campaigning hard against uh, the taxpayer funding this stadium. And of course, he is the third Labour opposition leader in their eight years in opposition. First, there was um, John Robertson. He had to resign spectacularly when it turned out he'd given a character reference to Man Monas, the Link Cafe uh, siege uh, perpetrator. And then Luke Foley uh, resigned last last November after it was revealed he'd uh, sexually handled a, a female ABC journalist. So Michael Daly, he's... So he was accused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so Michael Daly came into the job only in November last year, but the, the polls are 50-50, so he's pretty much got all of the momentum that Luke Foley had when he was leader. The, the change in leader and the spectacular downfall of Luke Foley doesn't seem to have made a, a difference there. And it seems that voters have pretty much forgotten about why they chucked out Labour in, in 2011, even though Eddie O'Bead and Ian MacDonald are always brought up all the time and they're they're willing to trust labor again with with infrastructure and service delivery um yeah i mean i think particularly like i mean at least with luke foley to talk a little, little really briefly on him i think a lot of voters didn't even know who he was um <laughs> until all this stuff came out like hang on that's right labor exists and there's a opposition i think um i think that's also part of the problem is that people don't remember these things people forget very quickly and um, this is just what it's always been like, I guess, in democracy. People don't remember unless the media is reminding them. Um, unless something really catastrophic happened, which really, I mean, nothing explicitly catastrophic occurred. So there's nothing to really be said about that um, regarding Labor. Just, you know, stagnation isn't considered catastrophic for them. So I guess um, what we're going to see is potentially people just don't care. They don't remember. Liberals try to remind them but people have short memories. Now, the Legislative Assembly, the lower house, that's where government is formed in New South Wales. That's what obviously the media focuses on, but the New South Wales upper house, that has 42 members and is elected by a proportional representation with 21 members elected every four years for an eight year term, which means the, the quota to be elected is only around about 4%. So it allows for an array of minor parties to to get elected now from the the right wing it's always been the shooters fishers and farmers party and the christian democrats they've always won a seat each but this election there's five right wing minor parties vying for a seat uh, as well as the the shooters and the the christian democrats there's one nation under mark latham's leadership there's the australian conservatives with greg walsh as their candidate and the liberal democrats with uh, david lionhelm resigning from the senate to uh, contest the the new south wales upper house so there's five right-wing parties wrangling over well at the moment it's two seats they could probably probably squeeze three of them there but as always with the the right it's it's very fractured and there's not going to be room for for all of them so so that's going to be a real tussle there um yeah i think mark latham getting in is almost a guarantee um there's enough support for one nation locally that he'll get in um even though he uh kind of split the base with his uh push for this uh, Eros chick in Hornsby and then um, Pauline Hanson confirmed that by doing an interview with her. Yeah, um, a that, Muslim that candidate. Ups, yeah, um, and that kind of upset the base because they're like, you know, you're supposed to be anti-Muslim and now you've got Muslim candidates. So the, the, the base is kind of split. There's some people who think she's okay. There's some people who are completely put off by it. Um, but um, I don't think that will stop Latham from getting a seat. Um, now we have the Australian Conservatives, of whom I was most recently a member. Um, I won't go into why I'm not anymore, but um, but basically I think that the party, the party I don't think has a um, a strong presence in the community. I don't think um, many people know about the Australian Conservatives. I think if you went into Sydney and asked the average person, have you ever heard of the Australian Conservatives before, they're probably going to say no. Um, uh, they might have a solid base of people who are willing to vote for them. Uh, I don't know. They don't even really poll for them at all. I think I saw one poll, and I think it was a very, like, obscure polling. 
Um, and it, it had, I think, AC with like 10%, but I, I don't believe they would have 10%. I don't think it's yeah. that strong. They've only had one electoral test in New South Wales. That was the Benelong by-election, where they got 4% of the, the vote, but that mm. was only because they ate into the Christian Democrat vote, which was at the last federal election 7%, which went down to 3%. So the conservative minor party vote was still stuck at 7%. Yeah, and as well, they had so much media coverage. There was like this, there was a massive thing about this, this, this breakaway party, this rebellion from the Liberal Party. It's going to change politics. It's going to really, you know, shift up, you know, shake up the right. Then they have this, uh, the, the, the Benelong by-election, and there's a lot of focus. The, everyone knew about them and all this kind of, and they didn't get anything. And um, I think that basically took all of the wind out of their momentum. And since then... Um, they also had a test of their elect electability in South Australia um, when they ran in that election. It was really pathetic outcome. I think it was like 4% or something, I don't recall. It was pretty poor, um, and I don't see why they would do any better this election. Now, the Christian Democrats, they've, they've always done well in New South Wales because that's where Fred Nile is based, but he's nearing the end of, well, not just his career, but his life, and uh, so their spot is not, not guaranteed, especially with a challenge from Australian Conservatives. And obviously, I mentioned the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, they've got quite good infrastructure in New South Wales now, especially with the lower house member, but the the shooters vote, obviously the Liberal Democrats are, are after that. Uh, One Nation, though, they've uh, basically said they agree now with the uh, 1996 National Firearms Agreement. Mark Latham has been on the record for many years as a supporter of gun control. So that's a another uh, f fracturing of the sort of base of One Nation. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Um, One Nation, I think, is relying on the voters' ignorance more than it's relying upon their knowledge because I don't think they want the voters to know that they've, you know, they, they, they've moved away from these key things that voters that would lean that way actually care about. So I think um, the big thing will be that uh, I don't think LDP will do very well. Um, David Lyham was very, very, very lucky to have got elected um, he just stole that from CDP in the federal election, um, and he would be, I think, extremely lucky if he ended up getting enough votes to actually steal himself a seat. Um, and then also on top of that, we have CDP. CDP, I think, is, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that they kind of always just tugged along and kept the base that's been loyal to them for a long time. But on top of that, also, their base is a dying base because... Um, a lot of people who vote for them are generally older generation um, Christians from, you know, 30 years ago. My grandma used to vote for them and now she's passed away. It's that kind of, the, the, the people who would care about their issues is no longer around. Um, so I think that will be a big thing about, you know, the, the demographic shift um, particularly is also important um, as, you know, a lot of immigration has shifted up the, the normal um, voting outcome and stuff like that. We have, I think, I was looking at statistics from the um, Australian Bureau of Statistics today, and I think that the, like, you know, the, the people who speak Europe, the, you know, European languages have been, uh, and now are technically in a minority in Sydney, um, so we can't expect them to really vote for CDP anymore, um, especially I don't think many um, immigrants will be voting for those kind of right-wing parties. So I think One Nation is really going to be the one that pushes it. Even though they've had a couple of kind of four pars, I don't think it will hurt them in the end. Now, on the, the left spectrum in the upper house, the, those parties tend to get two to three seats last uh, 2015 election, the Greens got two, the Animal Justice Party got one, the Greens have three in the lower house, but there's been an internal New South Wales Greens meltdown with uh, moderate Jeremy Buckingham uh, spectacularly tearing up his membership of the toxic New South Wales Greens and running as a green independent uh, ticket. So he's basically say, uh, confirmed what everyone thought is that the New South Wales Greens will be taken over by revolutionary uh, Marxists. And so it's going to be interesting there about how the, the left wing parties do and whether the, the Greens under this sort of new uh, Marxist majority can retain its influence in the upper house and its seats. 
Yeah, I mean, the Greens are kind of in a in a spiral at the moment. There's a lot of people I know who are on the left who are very upset with them. Um, they, they, they really, <laughs> really dislike them because of their kind of toxic, you know, behaviour and stuff like that. You know, I think that it will be interesting. People, I, I don't know if their base that would vote for them really grasp that there's a problem there. I think they're kind of just going to vote for them regardless, perhaps. Um, either that or if there's been this really successful kind of um, progressive movement within these communities to try and move towards a, uh, I don't know, like some kind of other party that's more progressive, I don't know. Um, I, I don't really know deep into kind of that left-wing politics, um, but I know that for um, for sure, I think that it will be an interesting result anyway, because the, the, the there's also the side where the people on the left aren't happy with Labor um, on, on a multitude of different things. Um, because they they want massive progress in all circumstances, and as soon as Labor says, oh, you know, we want to change our boat policy, then they freak out. So we'll see if there's a drive away. Um, but again, there's a lot of Labor candidates who are pretty outwardly progressive, so we'll see. Now, as I mentioned, it's it's very close. The polls are at 50-50, though the opinion polls, which are not, tend to favour Labor, 51-49 uh, or 52-48. So it's going to be incredibly hard to uh, predict. But uh, this election, depending on who the voters choose, it's going to drastically change New South Wales because it's four-year terms there, and four years is a very long time. And so depending on who wins, that's going to fundamentally change what type of state New South Wales is. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I think um, what we have is, you know, the, the potential for even a like minority government, which would be um, very interesting if that occurred. And I think if we don't, um, you know, if, if we see that kind of thing develop, whether it's a minority government, um, and, you know, even worse situation is where it's a minority government where Labor has to have buy from the Greens or something like that. That would be a big thing because then the Greens would be tugging them in all sorts of directions, as we saw in federal government when they had a federal minority. Um, I think it has the potential for a big shift and a big change. And um, it's worrying, but I mean, look, uh, politics is what it's been for the last while. This isn't really unprecedented. We've seen it everywhere. Um, and I'm not really that surprised, I guess. Uh, well, it's certainly election night, it's it's certainly going to be a highly anticipated, unpredictable night. And you're going to be joining me on the Unshackled New South Wales election night live stream, as we do for all elections. So we'll be able to together see the results as they unfold. Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for joining me today on the show, Daniel. I look forward to speaking with you more in the future. Thanks for having me on. See you later. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. As I mentioned just then, we are doing another Unshackled Election Night live stream for the New South Wales state election. It will begin at 6 p.m. Australian Daylight Eastern Time and will be on Facebook and YouTube Live and will feature a wide variety of New South Wales-based alt-media personalities. It will be on throughout the night, offering our own alternative analysis of the results as they come in, both from the lower and upper house. Now, further update on the Deplorables Tour. Immigration Minister David Coleman reversed the Home Affairs Department decision to refuse Milo Yiannopoulos a visa. So far, he's the only confirmed speaker out of the three to obtain a visa. So the tour will now be delayed until late April as the promoters Penthouse Australia still want to secure visas for Gavin McGuinness and Tommy Robinson. I can speak with some certainty that there will be no more delays to the tour given that the federal election is due in May and Labor, given they criticised Coleman's decision to grant Milo a visa, there is no way they would allow this tour to take place. So I guess that means we are counting down the days until our free speech is taken away. Another tour we have been promoting, which is guaranteed to go ahead because it features a leftist speaker, is the Conversation About Feminism show featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which we hope proves that Australia is still capable of mature political discourse. Please go to thisis42.com slash feminist for more information and to buy tickets. Our editor at large, Steel Archer, is back from Liberty Fest in Perth and is now working with me in the Unshackled studio. He will join me on the show soon to give us a debrief about Liberty Fest and to inform us what he's got planned while he's down here in Melbourne.
As always, remember that we can only continue our mission and work at The Unshackled with the support of our followers. There are many ways you can support us, as there is no excuse. You can pledge over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled or directly via our PayPal link at paypal.me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium memberships on our website, which is theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.